Father, we have a whole lot of smoke going on in the news. Maybe there's some fire behind it on certain issues lately. But our eyes should be constantly kept on Israel. Everything centers around Jerusalem. You have promised that you're going to return. You're going to establish your kingdom. And when you return, you said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. And we're watching weapons proliferate throughout the world. Rogue nations going nuclear. So much happening. And our job, Lord, is simply to stand in the evil day, to let our light so shine before men that when they see our good works, they'll glorify our Father which is in heaven. We're simply called to be witnesses. We don't even have to be evangelists, just witnesses. To be different than the world around us. And so, Lord, as we work through your word, help us to continue to have the mind of Christ when we encounter evil and darkness to turn away and to seek, Lord, to be found waiting for you without spot, without blemish, ready for your return. So bless your church tonight, Lord, with your word and strengthen them, I pray, in their walk that, Lord, should you come immediately, we have nothing to be ashamed of. So even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and open your word to your people by the Holy Spirit tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I had to drop a daughter off at the airport really early this morning, so I know I have a great habit of putting people to sleep on a Sunday or a Wednesday, but tonight, tonight I might just put myself to sleep. You never know. So it doesn't take me long, man. As soon as my head's down, gone. So, so if I just start you know, talking about really strange, random things, I'm on the edge. I'm just... Come get me, Lou. Just a reminder. Wherefore let him, verse 12, chapter 10, who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And you know, the sad part is those same old temptations just keep working. Generation after generation, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Works every time. Same hook, different fish, always works. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is to common to man. And God is faithful, who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted, above that you are able. But will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape. And it's always the word of God. That you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. 2 Timothy, for a minute, chapter 2, something that I wanted to mention last week and I failed to, so good news, I have this week. But 2 Timothy, chapter 2, in an interesting parallel to this, says, 2 Timothy 2, 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. That's comforting. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and vessels of silver, but also of wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. And obviously you get the idea, there are chamber pots. How many know what those are? How many need help from their neighbor? There are also vessels they would hang up high that have jewelry or other things, where they would keep it up high and safe from the kids. There are other things that were considered honorable. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, iniquity, verse 19, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, set apart, meet, fit, ready for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work, parallel thought. So flee also youthful lusts. Did you know you don't have to be a youth to have youthful lusts? Some of you youth are going, oh, creepy. Oh, no. Youthful lusts don't belong solely to the youth. Flee, youthful lusts. Fuego, flee, run. Follow, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with them that call on the Lord. Look at this. 
out of a pure heart. So this exhortation again, temptation will come, but if you flee from it, like Joseph, leave the garment in her hands, get out of the house, and yeah, it may cause some trouble, but God will be your defense. Just the reminder to flee, because we're too often think, well, just, well, I can handle it. No, you can't. So again, verse 23, all things are lawful for me, chapter 10, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. In this case of eating things offered to idols, whatever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, hey, this, the hay is added by me, hey, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, because you know an idol's nothing, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Do you get the sense in these last three chapters, there's a theme of be careful what you do that it doesn't stumble others. How many got that theme? How many are awake? How many got that theme? Should be same number. Okay, because that's the setup for chapter 11. Once you know that's our theme, chapter 11 becomes a lot easier. Conscience, I say, not of thy own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Verse 30, for if I by grace be a partaker, why am I then evil spoken of? For that which I give thanks. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do. Boy, that's a blank check. Do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Three groups mentioned. What were they? Jews, Jews non-Jews, church. How many caught that? Now, not all Jews are in the church, but in the church there are Jews. How many followed that? Okay. Not all Gentiles are in the church, but in the church there are Gentiles. How many followed that? Okay, wonderful. So you can be a Jewish believer, you can be a Gentile believer, and having opened your heart to Jesus Christ by faith, asking his forgiveness, trusting him from your heart that he paid for you, that you have no right to be in heaven, but you're with him. That's my answer. I'm with him. He said he paid for me, and I believe his shed blood has cleansed my record. Having done that, You've received Christ as your Savior. You have eternal life. Therefore, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, as we see in Galatians 3.28, a slave or a free person, a male or a female, all are one in Christ. You're all in his church, sons and daughters of God. Now, why do I belabor this? Well, because there's a movement afoot today that is trying to say that God is finished with the Jews God has replaced the Jews or Israel with the church. And now they call the church spiritual Israel. And so this idea of, well, that the Jews are sort of out of the plan of God. Now he's taking over the church. The church is spiritual Israel. The problem is they forgot to read this verse because there are three groups. There are Jews, there are non-Jews, and then there are the church. Note the delineation of the three. Israel is Israel. The church is the church. If you get these conflated together or mixed up in some fashion, next thing you know, you're going to have ideas of like, well, see, the church has to go through the tribulation because it talks about an elect. Yeah, those are elect Jews who say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're found to be sheep, not goats, by their practical witness that demonstrated their faith. Matthew 25. So this is important to understand. The church is the church, the Jews are the Jews, and the Gentiles are the Gentiles. Both Jews and Gentiles are welcome in the church, but the church has not replaced the Jews. They're different. The last seven years are the time of Jacob's trouble, where God refines the Jews through that seven-year period. It is the 70th week of Daniel. 
And that 70th week is to finish the transgression, make reconciliation for iniquity, um, make an end of sin. The second half will be bring in everlasting righteousness, fulfill vision and prophecy, and then anoint the most holy. Those are the things those 70 weeks were to achieve. The first 69 weeks made an end of sins, made reconciliation for iniquity, and finished the transgression. The 70th week is going to bring in everlasting righteousness, complete vision and prophecy, and they're going to anoint the Son of God, the most holy, on the throne of David. That's what's coming. So that final seven-year period is to fulfill the 70th week against your holy city, Jerusalem, and your holy people, the Jews. So the Jews are the Jews, and the church is the church. If you can't keep that straight, pretty soon you can't understand prophecy. Just wanted to point that out because there's some very sincere ministries that are completely out in left field and stuck in the mud because they've conflated the two. So I just wanted to point that out in case you're struggling with that. So give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things. Remember, he's become all things to all men as those who had the laws with the law, to those without the laws, those without the law, but not without law to Christ, etc., etc. He tried to draw all to Jesus. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many. Why? That they may be saved. If you are an adulterer, actively so, what does the Bible tell you not to be? Deceived. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you are a thief, what does the Bible tell you? Don't be deceived. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 again. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you're caught up in the gay lifestyle, what does the Bible tell you? Not to be deceived. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. Fornicator, adulterer, gay lifestyle, drunken or drunk, thieves, blasphemers, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, there are times when the church will pick one particular sin and really aggressively go after those caught up in that kind of sin and berate them in such a way that you don't really hear the love of God. Romans 2, 4 says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Jesus, when he taught the parable of the prodigal son, that son who took half the inheritance and went and squandered it on women and wild living and gambling until the money ran out and then basically sold himself to be less than a slave in his father's own house to where he finally wakes up and realizes he's eating with pigs. When he finally, and it says a very important statement, when he came to himself. And that's, a, that's an aha breakthrough moment in the life of an individual. When you come to yourself and you realize I'm destroying my life, or the things I was pursuing, thinking I would find satisfaction or pleasure or meaning, I've attained it and I'm just as horribly empty as I was when I started, but now even more jaded than I began because I'm asking, is this all there is? You've climbed the tap of the ladder only to find out they're fools at the top. I've had people do that and tell me about it. And if you don't understand, it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. And you get just this caustic attacking of, you know, you're going to burn. When that prodigal son came to himself, my servants in my father's house eat better than I do. I'm going to go home and say, I'm not worthy to be one of your sons. I'm not looking for inheritance. Just let me be one of your servants. Let me go back to work. And as Jesus tells the story, as the son comes over basically the ridge to the property, the father saw him a great way off, which means that father had been longing and looking for that lost child. And something you never do in the Middle East, the father ran to him, wept, hugged him. The son's trying to get his rehearsed speech out. Father, I'm not like, great, nice home. Quick, get sandals, put a ring on him, get him a robe. Well, we'll bathe him later, right? I mean, that, 
that whole thing. And he just loved him, and they rejoiced. And the older brother, when he threw me a party. When we forget that heart of God, and all we do is just beat people up and you're a sinner. You're a sinner. Man, man, are you a sinner. As opposed to, are you satisfied? Preach to the heart. Go after the heart. Gee, you have everything you ever wanted, so I guess you're completely satisfied now, right? If they're honest, they're like, no. That's what's so troubling. You've got one side of the church no longer bringing any conviction to be not deceived, whether drunk, thief, fornicator, adulterer, caught up in the gay lifestyle, homosexual, feminine, whatever. These things will not inherit the kingdom of God. One side won't even talk about it. They'll just say, well, God's love. Yeah, he is love, but he's justice. And sadly, the other extreme side is so busy just beating him up and berating him that they don't hear the love of God. They just hear, you're going to burn. And yet when God came down in human flesh, the sinners couldn't get enough of being around him. And many repented. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many. Why is he doing this? Why is he trying not to be offensive and stumble people? But he's still speaking truth that they may be saved. Not stumbled, saved. So be followers of me. Mimites in the Greek, mimic. Be followers of me, as, even as I am also of Christ. Boy, that's a tall order. How many of you would say, look, follow my walk. You'll be okay. That's a convicting tall order, isn't it? Now, chapter 11, verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. <laughs> you know, he actually has some praise for Corinth. Keep that in mind as we work our way through. I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. So praise God. The majority of them are really trying to abide in Jesus and they're following what is essentially the apostles' doctrine, the teaching of the apostles. But I would have you to know, here's an area we need some education, that the head of every man is Christ. Okay, he's in charge over the man. And the head of the woman is the man. That's assuming she's married, obviously or under her father's roof. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. What does that mean? Flip over to chapter 15. I'll show you what it means. The head of Christ is God. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Love it. Because Jesus must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet, right? So the last enemy, verse 26, that shall be destroyed is death. There are a lot of pronouns here, but we're going to attach the correct name just so we can follow through what's being said. For the Father has put all things under the Son's feet. But when the, when the Father saith all things are put under the Son, it is manifested that the Father is accepted, which did put all things under the Son. And when all things shall be subdued unto the Son, then shall the Son himself be in subject unto the Father, that put all things under the sun, that God may be all in all. What does that mean? It means God, there's order within even the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, so I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Guys, you're accountable to him. The head of the woman is the man. Ladies, you're under your husband's authority. We'll talk about it. And the head of Christ is God. He's under the Father. He said only those things that please the Father. He said it throughout John's gospel. So every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth, or shame, his head. Who's the head of every man? Christ. Okay, wonderful. Why would a man who has his head covered be dishonoring to Jesus? Now, how many of you are going, well, wait a minute, but the Jews all wear their prayer shawls and they have like the whole thing and they and all that. I mean, I've seen the photos right at the Western Wall. I mean, how many are going, but but the Jews cover their heads. How many? Yes. How many have that? How many have already fallen asleep? I'm not far behind. <laughs> the Jews covered their heads because they basically said we're unworthy to approach God. When Jesus said it is finished and gave up the spirit. What happened in the temple? 
The veil was torn from top to bottom, inches thick, however 30, whatever feet long, torn from top to bottom. Thus symbolizing through the death of Jesus Christ, the access to God is now directly through him. You no longer need a priesthood. Because when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, again, no matter where you're a thief or whatever you're caught up in, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you come under his righteousness. You come under his atoning work. Your sins come under his blood. And so now when the Father views you, he no longer views you in rebellion to him. He sees you because of your faith in Jesus in submission to him through the blood of Christ. And you now wear his, Jesus' righteousness because the Bible tells us there is no one righteous, no, not one. Old Testament says it this way. All of our righteousness is like filthy rags. But when I come under the blood atonement, when I come by faith and put myself under Jesus' care, now I come under his righteousness, his shed blood, and I am viewed by the Father in the righteousness of the Son, and even better, I am loved by the Father with the love he has for his Son because we have believed his report. This wonderful truth of God. So positionally, you have come under Christ's righteousness. That's why when you put on the armor of God, you put on the breastplate of righteousness. It is his righteousness that you are now covered in. What a beautiful truth. So here, when you go in covering your head, that idea of when a man prays or prophesies with his head covered, it's as though he's denying the very work of Christ that has split the veil, shed his blood, covered our sins and atoned for them. We have been made righteous through the blood of Christ. So now we can boldly enter into his throne, Hebrews tells us, because we come by the blood of Christ through faith in the Son of God who loved us. So now any man praying or prophesying with his head covered dishonors the redemptive work as the idea that Christ has done on his behalf to open the door of righteousness to him. Now, if you get kidnapped, would to God it never happens. And you've got a potato sack over your head. And you want to pray for help. You're like, oh, but Lord, I've got a sack on my head. <laughs> Special dispensation from your pastor, okay? <laughs> you can pray, okay? You get covered with mud or something. You're, you're a mudslide. You can just, common sense, all right? But just pointing that out, just, <gasps> just letting you know there is common sense. But the idea is if you constantly, your head is covered. Any man praying or prophesying having his head covered dishonors his head. The idea is the Jews don't feel righteous to approach God, but we've come to the Son of God who's the path of righteousness to God, and his righteousness is upon us. So just keep that in mind. So he's just laying out things. I just would, again, have you to understand the ordinances and all that that I'm instructing you for. Now, next thing, head of the woman is the man. Who set that up? Bunch of patriarch patriarchal men who have, who set it up? God. Genesis 3, go back. I'm going to show you because if I tell you, I don't know if I can trust him. So I'll show it to you. Remember, this was translated in 300 BC from Hebrew to Greek. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Genesis, some of these other things recorded there. We know, again, that record is, that record is around the time of Christ. Jerome, when he translates Latin Vulgate 300, roughly AD, same thing. All the different manuscripts and accounts, same story. So in the cool of the day, the Lord was walking in the garden. Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord. Verse 8, the Lord called unto Adam and said, where are you? And Adam said, well, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where I commanded thee, thou that shouldst not eat? And the man said, the woman that you gave me, one, it's your fault. The woman you gave me, she gave me the tree, it's her fault, and I did eat. What a guy. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent, who by the way God created, your fault, beguiled me, and I did eat. The Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed or followers and her seed. Her seed shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. First prophecy. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire, that's longing or violent urge or strong urge, thy desire shall be to your husband, many argue to rule over, 
or to desire in other ways. And he shall, mashal, govern, control, or be in charge. He shall rule over you. God put it in order. He put it in order. Now, while you're doing that, turn to Galatians 3. Galatians 3, verse 28. While you're getting there, you need to know, if you've put your faith in Jesus, verse 26 says, you are all the children of God by faith. Love that, not works. By faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ by faith. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free, slave or free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. You're all equally his. Okay, so all are equal. However, God has established an order within the home. So back to our chapter, verse 3. I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. Question, what if your man is doing ungodly things and wants you to do them too? Now what do you do? He has abused his power. Now you go straight to the head, Christ. You stay in obedience to him. And that has been sadly something I've observed in marriages where a husband will go off into real left field. The wife is like, no, no. You know, well, she needs, no, she doesn't. She's listening to her head, Christ, because you're out of order. If you're upset with that, guys, email me. <clears throat> Stephen at, he'll handle you on my behalf. The head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is the man. But if the man's out of order, then you know, ladies, you've got to be in submission to Jesus. And the head of Christ is God the Father. We covered that. So every man praying and prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors that redemptive work of Jesus who has made us righteous through his shed blood, his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth, wait a second, first thing we need to notice, what were women allowed to do? Pray and prophesy. Keep that in mind when we get to later, let women keep silence in the church in Corinthians. I'll explain that when we get there. If you're not sure what it means, you have to come back. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, so she doesn't have a kaluma, as often they call it, kind of a, a covering or scarf. With her head uncovered, she dishonoreth her head. Who's her head normally? Her husband. Now, once again, I have to read to you some history. Oh, dim the lights so we can just, you know. But actually, in this case, I wanted to read the history because once I read this to you and you understand what's going on, I think it will greatly improve your ability to understand what he's trying to say. First one coming from uh, talesoftimesforgotten.com. This will be in the office if you want to get this. I leave it when I quote things so they can bring it up for you. The ancient Greek word hetere, the plural form, which is heterai, literally means a female companion. Some academic dispute exists over whether the precise meaning of this word, but the traditional and most widely accepted interpretation holds that the term refers to a class of female hired companions or courtesans who provided companionship and entertainment to mostly upper-class Greek men in exchange for payment. At the request of their clients, they would sing, dance, play instruments, engage in conversation, and provide sexual services. They would often accompany their clients to symposia or drinking parties. You thought those were new. Where they would provide enter entertainment for all the guests. Greek sources frequently describe the hetere, or at least the famous successful ones, as witty, high-cultured, and well-informed about the topics of contemporary political, philosophical, and social discussion. For instance, the Greek writer Athenaeus and Nocratus, who flourished in around the late second or third century uh, AD, dedicates most of the book of 13 of his Wise Men at Dinner to a discussion of the wise and or clever sayings of famous hetari. It was generally not socially, let me try this slowly for you, it was generally not socially acceptable or permitted for a free Greek citizen woman to become a hetari, high class call girl, basically is what they are. Instead, most or all women who worked as hetari in antiquity were thought to have been either slaves or free resident foreigners who lacked citizenship in the city where they lived and worked. Hetari have been compared to modern Japanese geishas. Unlike modern geishas, however, hetari were actually sex workers, and they frequently, although perhaps not always, provided sexual services to their clients. Corinth's 
advantageous location on the Isthmus of Corinth allowed the city to have two different ports, one on the other side of the Isthmus. Remember, they dragged the boats across. This naturally made it a major center for maritime trade, receiving ships from both sides of the Peloponnesos. As a result of this, a large number of sailors and merchants were constantly passing through the city. These men spent considerable time on ships without women and, in many cases, upon coming to a port in the city, longed desperately for female companionship and were willing to pay good money in exchange for it. This contributed to increased economic demand for heterae. It should therefore come as little surprise that Corinth was renowned in antiquity for its heterae. The ancient Greek poet Pindaros of Thebes notably describes Hetera as Corinth in his Scolian Fragment 122, which has been well preserved by a quotation of Athenaeus uh, about the wise men at dinner. So Corinth is known for having a lot of these higher class prostitutes. Now, a little more on prostitution in ancient Greece, more than you wanted to know, but funny you're all still awake. Mm-hmm. This coming from uh, Clafford, we'll have it in the office again. It's got a long URL, but prostitution was a common aspect of ancient Greece. In the more important cities, in particular the many ports, it employed a significant number of people and represented a noble part of economic activity in their eyes. It was far from being clandestine. Cities did not condemn brothels, but rather only instituted regulations on them. The pornai, P-O-R-N-A-I, pornai, were found at the bottom end of the scale. They were, as alluded to by the entomology, the word comes from paranimi, to sell the property of pimps or um, pornoboscos who received a portion of their earnings. This owner could be a citizen, for this activity was considered as a source of income just like any other. One fourth century BC orator cites two. Thrasoprastus in characters lists pimp next to cook. Just letting you know the world. Innkeeper and tax collector, as an ordinary profession, though disrepute, disreputable. The owner could also be male or a female metic. In classical era of ancient Greece, the porni were slaves of barbarian origin, non-Greek, for those who don't remember. Starting in the Hellenistic era, the case of young girls abandoned by their citizen fathers could be added. They were considered to be slaves until proven otherwise. Porni were usually employed in brothels located in, quote, red light districts of the period, such as Piraeus, Port of Athens, and Karmamikos in Athens. If you remember when we were at Beth Shen, there's actually a little tile indicating that part of town they found. Second class, hetera. More expensive and exclusive prostitutes, again, were known as a hetera, which means companion. Hetera, unlike Pornai, engaged in long-term relationships with individual clients and provided companionship as well as sex. Unlike Pornai, Hetera seemed to have been paid for their company over a period of time rather than for each individual act. Hetera were often educated, and free Hetera were able to control their own finances. Around the year 2 of BC, Strabo, in his geographic historical description of the town of Corinth, wrote some remarks concerning uh, female temple servants in the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth, which perhaps should be dated somewhere around 700 to 400 BC, their range. It says, quote, the temple of Aphrodite was so rich that it employed more than a thousand heterias. Both men and women had given to the goddess. Many people visited the town on account of them. That's why they came. And thus a heteris contributed to the riches of the town, for ship captains frivolously spent their money there. Hence the saying, the, vo the voyage to Corinth is not for every man. The text in more than one way hints at the sexual business of those ladies. Remarks elsewhere of Strabo, women earning money with their bodies, as well as Athenaeus in the lovely beds picking the fruits of the mildest bloom, concerning this temple describe this character even more graphically. In 464 BC, a man named Xenophon, a citizen of Corinth, who was an acclaimed runner and winner of a pentathlon at the Olympic Games, dedicated 100 young girls to the temple of the goddess as a sign of thanksgiving. We know this because of a hymn which Pindar was commissioned to write, celebrating the very welcoming girls, servants of Pithos of luxurious Corinth. Social conditions of prostitutes are difficult to evaluate as women. They were already marginalized in Greek society. That's why when you hear there's neither slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, the gospel made them equal. All are one in Christ. 
The social conditions of prostitutes are difficult to evaluate as women as they were already marginalized in Greek society. We have known of no direct evidence of either their lives or the brothels in which they worked. It is likely that Greek brothels were similar to those of Rome, described by numerous authors and preserved at Pompeii, dark, narrow, and malodorous places. One of the many slang terms for prostitutes was literally one who hits the ground, indicating this by the acts that took place directly on the ground. Last thing for us, during the time of the new comedy of ancient Greek comedy, prostitute characters, listen, this actually means something for a text. During the time of the new comedy, prostitute characters became, after the fashion of slaves, the veritable stars of the comedies. This could be for several reasons. While old comedy of ancient Greek comedy concerned itself with political subjects, New comedy dealt with the private subjects and daily life of Athenians. Also, social conventions forbade well-born women from being seen in public. So the prostitutes would be out in public, but not the well-born women. How many are following me here? So that's who they would use in their satire. The prostitutes are out in public. While the plays depicted outside activities, the only women who would normally be seen out in the street were logically the prostitutes. Okay, now let's try our text. Every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. The prostitutes in Corinth went about without their heads covered. So, if that were the rule today in you know, Chester County here, and any woman without her head covered is a potential prostitute or her terai, So how was church? There's a bunch of women with their heads uncovered. You're kidding. How many are starting to follow this? So at Corinth, because of their unique conditions with prostitution, in the town of Corinth, when a woman is there and her head is uncovered and she's sitting with her husband, is it her husband? Is it her paramour? Is she his wife? Today the modern term would be, is she her, his sugar baby? You have to look it up, but don't, it's not gonna help you. She dishonors her head if she's uncovered because that's what the prostitutes would do. So people would think that this guy's wife is a prostitute and worse, or mistress, or worse, she's open and start hitting on her while the husband's sitting there. So any woman whose head is uncovered dishonors her head, her husband. For that were even all one as if she were shaven. Now the problem is Jews often would shave the heads of prostitutes. So now if she's shaven, the Jews are going, hmm. And if she has a covering off, the Corinthians are going, hmm. Now you're getting, hmm, I got it. Okay, fine. For the woman is not, the, oh, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris. Yes. There are women today who wear some form of a covering. And they're not from Corinth. Yes. Why do they do that? Well, because they saw here in Scripture that having their head uncovered would be dishonoring to their husbands, dishonoring a sense in their witness to the Lord. And so they've decided to continue that. That's between them and God. Well, does that mean then I as a woman, I'm not a woman, but women out in the audience, I as a woman would need to cover my head? Well, did he say this to the Ephesians? Philippians? Colossians? When he wrote to T Timothy about the older women teaching the younger women and to Titus again about the older women instructing the younger women, when they wrote about how to teach the younger women to be godly, even First Peter, when he talked about don't let it be the outward adorning and braiding of hair, and all these places where they should have said, and by the way, ladies, make sure you've got your head covering on, nothing. Only in Corinth, where there are all these prostitutes and a high-class hetero that are very well known throughout the Greco-Roman world. In other words, if this was essential for every woman, then it should be repeatedly told to us throughout, like faith, baptism, salvation through Christ. It's only at Corinth. And now you know a little history for those who stayed awake. Now you know why this was a problem at Corinth and not mentioned elsewhere. Okay, fine. So there you go. So if it's a shame for her to be shorn or shaven, well, then let her be covered, right? Let's just not stumble any. Hey, that's the last three chapters. Let's not mislead or stumble people giving the wrong impression. We want them to come to know Jesus. What do you know? It's the same thought. 
For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. Okay? And Christ has opened that door for us. But the woman is the glory of the man. Remember, she, God created her from Adam's rib. He created for Adam a help mate. He that finds a wife finds favor with the Lord. A wife is a gift from God. The woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman. Okay, that's Genesis 2. That's how God worked. But the woman for the man, yet they're equal before Christ. But she was bone of his bone. For this cause ought the woman to have power or exousia, authority on her head, a covering, because of the angels. Well, that clears it up. Oh, look, we're out of time. No, no, no. All right, I'll finish it up. All right. You're thinking, what does the, do the angels have to do with a head covering? How many have ever read that going, I'm really, I'm really, I'm just not getting this. Any honest person out there? Okay. The head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is the man. A man praying or prophesying with his head covered is denying that redemptive work of Christ where the way has been made open. You can now approach the Jesus directly to the Father through the blood of Christ. We have direct access. You don't need confession to a priesthood. You come directly to him. When a wife in Corinth doesn't have her head covered, everyone around her is wondering, is she a prostitute, a mistress, whatever? So in coming out from under the authority of her husband and presenting herself in a way that might be misconstrued as being a potential prostitute, then basically she's saying, I don't care if my behavior potentially shames my husband, which is a lack of respect for that position of authority. You see, the angelic realm of all realms understands the damage when the authority God has put in place has been rebelled against. And when instead of staying in a position that God has assigned to us before him, one steps out saying, I will do what I want. I will live my, way, my life the way I care to. I will not be identified by wearing a head covering. It was said this way, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be the most high. And so when the angelic realm sees rebellion to God's order that he's put in place for whatever purposes, for them, that is a troubling thing because they know where rebellion has taken this world. The original great transgression is Satan filled with pride, desiring himself to be worshipped, completely rebelled against God, and we are now in the mess we're in because of that act of rebellion. And then he went hunting in the garden. He went after the woman for whatever reason. We'll find out someday. She was deceived. She then chose Adam. He transgresses. Romantic. No, a mess. He transgresses. And boom, here we go. And it all started with, I don't want to be told what to do. That's why the angels watch this going, bad sign. Hope that helps. Well, because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. How many of you guys were birthed by a woman? <laughs> by the way, when you ask what is a woman, it is a biological female with the potential to produce a child. That's easy. That, I mean, was that hard? Imagine that. What a world. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. Neither the woman without the man, right? Because, ladies, you were born through the union of a husband and a wife, and originally came from a rib, and guys, you came from a mom. So there you go. So before you get all high and mighty, you need each other. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. But all things are of God. After all, he created these things, and this is the order he has put out there. So judge in yourselves... Is it comely that a woman, woman pray unto God uncovered? In Corinth, would that not be a distraction? Yes, it probably would. Doth not even nature teach you that if a man hath long hair, it's a shame unto him? Now listen, most of them wore kind of a kaluma or a, a, um, a tunic. And so if you're in very basic clothing, kind of a woven tunic, and you both have long hair, you come up behind and you're like, you go around and, you know, oh, it's a guy. Or, oh, it's a, you know. So the idea of long hair gives a bit of a hint of what's going on. And, of course, now I have a son from California with hair down there like, Psh. but anyway. He actually rocks it pretty well. But if it gets longer, we'll have a conversation. Actually, he's a grown man. He can do what he wants on his own. Just kidding. 
Does not even nature teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a shame. Listen, back in the day when I taught this, we had two brothers in the church, both with extremely long hair. And one sat in the old building there and the other one sat there. So I'd be like looking down here while I'm teaching because I'm like, oh, because they're, you know. It's not easy to be a pastor. Does not even nature teach you it's a shame for him to have long hair? But if a woman hath long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. In fact, you know, hair is quite a bit for ladies. Big deal. But if any man seem to be contentious, that's philinokos, or philinokios, which is a lover of contention or arguing. You ever met one? I've got a few. They come after me from time to time. Probably get one after this. Got a few from last weekend. But if any man seem to be contentious, you really got a bug in your bonnet about this. We have no such custom or common practice. In other words, this isn't across all the churches. We're dealing with a problem in Corinth. Neither the churches of God. So you get to go home and decide what makes sense for you. But if you are a woman, maybe you're listening, and you have a head covering, and you're doing it because you want to honor your husband, and you want to honor Jesus, my answer is, God bless you. God bless you. Don't you people choose to do and not do things because you don't want to dishonor the Lord or your testimony? Well, then don't pick on them. Look at that. Now we're really out of time. Let's stand. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus. We sit here in the Western world. Meanwhile, in many parts of the world, women do wear a head covering. It's just the way things go, even today. It's proper. Lord, if our lives are beyond reproach, it doesn't matter if we're in a potato sack, an Omani suit, or whatever, because the love of God is there. But if all we work about and worry about is the outward adorning so we can look religious, but we've never given our lives to Jesus, then we're churched, but we're not saved. There are a lot of people who've got choir robes, but they don't have Jesus. So, Lord, at the end of the day, what I pray for all who are listening is they know in their heart of heart there is a time when they ask your forgiveness like that prodigal son. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Let me be one of your servants. If they've not had that moment where they came to themselves and they realized the sins that they are in must be judged and they have to come home to you, And I pray right where they are in the car, listening on an iPod or whatever it is, but right where they are, tonight would be the night that they ask you to forgive them. They put their faith in you alone and they come under the atoning shed blood of Jesus by faith, not works. And through that act of surrendering their life to you, they will suddenly find themselves clothed in your righteousness and sealed with your Holy Spirit. So Father, we thank you for tonight and we pray that you go with your people this evening in Jesus' name. Amen.